Hello everyone, today we talk about workers' associations between the Roman Empire and early medieval Europe. Um, it's a topic I introduced for the first time actually in, a, in the perspective of um, starting a, a broader investigation for a topic that deserves, if anything, to um, debunk a bit the didactic conceptual um, idea of the existence of an ancient or medieval world. Right. Uh, we have now it's a complex topic we can't address now but substantially uh, there's been a, a debate historiographically speaking and now it's some generation old I mean a few generations old but still you know to make a, a very important difference relative to you know you know the, the idea of a counterposition between the Middle Ages to you know the Roman past whatever you know the, the, the differences weren't so deep and so on and 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 let's say that uh, at the time, there was much less uh, dialogue between the various disciplines. So, let's say that the a uh, great part of that historiography built the narrative from its own perspective, right? Naturally, um, there is there was a tendency in this regard to to say that fundamentally the two eras didn't have much to do with each other, and there is definitely a reason why we came up with a distinction of this kind is historically, not just historiographically speaking, so it's not that you don't have to, let's say, accept the fact that it was something that can be approximated as to something on its own, we can call Middle Ages, and uh, for the ancient world it becomes even more complex because telling the truth, right, um, maybe you can do it with the Roman world, it was something, you know, closer naturally to the Middle Ages, more circumscribed, more more unitary, right? More universal in kind, but, you know, what's the ancient world, right? Who do we make it uh, think, you know, the Hellenistic times, the Achaemenid times, we're talking about even, I don't know, the Bronze Age. Um, the, in, in there, uh, in there it's, at least it's pretty evident that there is no such a thing like an ancient world, maybe a classical world. We have overly, you know, idealized in, uh, as something... Uh, I wouldn't say unitary, but at least provided with certain specific and kind of positive uh, meanings, etc. So uh, this, as you understand, is a fascinating topic on, on its own. But today we speak specifically of the forms of aggregation, organization, and solidarity, whether secular or religious, which actually, for, for ancient standards and for great part of the, you know, most of the Middle Ages, were actually the very same thing. Right, never forget this. Among the workers um, of, of of this broader period, right, with the the idea that uh, objectively the the ancient ones uh, might have had an impact on the uh, development of guilds, medieval cities, right. Uh, many historians studied this stuff, right, for uh, more or less a century, as we were saying before, um, and they do not seem to have exhausted their ideas or interest toward this topic. And the current historical research seems, however, to have put aside, um, we, don't, we don't know whether definitely or as often happens historiographically speaking pro tempore, and especially when there is the, the idea that something has stopped, that's usually the, mo the acknowledgement, you know, that maybe there is something else we, we, we have to add, especially after some time's passed in research and further acquisitions, that seemed, I'd say, for a long time to be um, the key question in the history of these associations. I mean, if you think about it, yes. I mean, the continuity with the Roman world and with the, the ancient world, generally speaking, to the Middle Ages, um, is, is an important topic. I mean, even just think of the sinusoidal trend uh, regarding, you know, demographics, econ economics, um, in the last uh, gener generation, basically, we have mostly pointed at climate change. Today, we're coming back to, to realize that actually human societies change pretty damn well on their own <laughs> with greater uh, rapidity and, and, and flexibility that, you know, we can also put climate aside, which surely also played a part, no doubt, either. Um, but um, it, it's exactly the complexity of this phenomenon that makes us understand that, yes, there can be effectively a connection between the working associations of, of the Roman uh, Empire and the ones of medieval cities. Not just because most medieval cities, and properly 
cities as such, as we have defined just recently in those videos on medieval cities, the civitates, right, and we're talking about mostly Western Europe, um, were the same Roman cities most of the times, right, and especially in, in, in most Romanized lands, we have, in fact, the greatest continuity in the forms of uh, wealth concentration, political and social organization, municipal identity, right, so in th that's very evident, we could actually make, bit if we will make videos to point out in single big centers, so like think about Rome first of all, but even Milan or Ravenna just to remain in Italy, how much they, they actually maintain from ancient times in terms of sense of themselves of these communities that were proudly being, you know, from that city and uh, the, their elites um, portraying themselves in that kind and with all the the power, the clientele that these centers objectively maintained, right, in the, the, in, in the Mediterranean, especially the city, never died, right, in certain areas of, of northern Europe, yes, the, the Roman city didn't, you know, quite die uh, in, in absolute terms, but of course it was, you know, dramatically contracted, went up, depopulated, um, it's something different, but even in Central Europe, then in certain cases, where um, you know, soon lost part of it, most of its Roman um, character properly meant, um, also had a, a dramatic continuity uh, in terms of um, urbanization uh, on the base of Roman times and also previous times. Think about the Celtic legacy, not not a urbanism the Celts properly didn't have anything like that, but surely. Um, they, they had a certain forms of pro-urbanization, think about cities like Trier that will remain so, so important in Celtic time. It was founded even before Rome, right, uh, as a settlement of, of sort, and, uh, but that lived on in, a, in something, you know, major electors of, of the Holy Roman Empire, of the, of the Germanic nation from a certain time onward, so that, that tells you pretty damn well that the syncrasis of especially Romano-Germanic and also Christian, naturally, um, uh, identities that are, are the roots of, of, uh, of our Europe. And um, our question is today not much to try to, to, to trace a link but uh, b between these two years, but um, actually highlighting, if we want even denying the direct continuity, right, and observing that, of course, um, there was a, an important Chesura between the two eras, right? At the same time, understanding why this happened and reflecting on what could have actually been maintained um, to a certain degree. Um, why also this historiographical attention? Well, because of course, um, the it's certainly true that in Roman times even starting from the Republican era, but it's something we could easily trace before, probably, if, if we were documented enough. Uh, say, bodies and so-called collegia or of workers were formed, um, and some historians add spontaneously among the workers. That is to say, something very similar in line of principle, especially in, properly in terms of association to medieval guilds. And th the point here, methodologically saying, yes, it doesn't exist anything medieval or anything ancient. Humans tend to form these societies, these associations, right? Uh, and it is equally true uh, in all times. And it is equally true that these aggregations summarized in itself the aspects of sodalices, of mutual assistance, instruments of religious practice, and finally, but certainly not uh, with less uh, importance, of structures of organization of work. And these are all patterns that we can find um, very well in medieval guilds as, uh, as well. Um, first of all, we have to realize that, that these societies, and this can really help to make us understand why such differences at a point are also unimportant, were all cliently, right? Rome was not a state as we mean it in modern terms. Surely, and the Roman Empire developed, a, a, you know, a stable administration, a bureaucracy, a tax system, especially towards the late Roman Empire. That uh, is, is something that, for for um, for most of the Middle Ages, was not known, right? But at the same time, the properly the base 
over which, and it doesn't mean that the, the medieval world in this sense was, was backwards, right? Sometimes we'll see it was actually the other way around um, on a broader picture. But the question here is that this world, this, the, the, even the Roman state floated on private clienteles, right? The, the Roman Empire, if you, if you just think about the, the senatorial and imperial provinces, what was founded f fundamentally as, as on private possessions, on uh, these enormous latifundi in the hands of the most powerful families. For a while, it was also a, a middle class that worked pretty well, that also integrated, you know, this um, uh, newly Romanized populations with a certain uh, important craft and capabilities and so on. But we're talking about pre-industrial times, um, moments in which um, the per capita wealth was still dramatically low, so the, it, it's normal for for all these societies to, on, on the long run, after a, you know some some dramatic upheaval that could be like in the case of Rome, a conquest, an invasion, and this is something that every people basically did in waves for millennia and millennia and millennia. I mean, it, it, it's the same the same story repeating itself over and over again. Um, there is no people that hasn't properly arrived to some, I mean, to, to a place where there were other people and basically wiped them out. Not even one, right? We have all done it. And th the question is, um, how do you make it work? The answering thing. Well, uh, on the long run, you can redistribute wealth. That is, you seize these lands, you you basically remunerate those who have conquered them. But on the long run, and especially also if you look at demographic resources, um, it's it's always about mostly the people who pre-existed that managed to utter, uh, absorb or sedentarize to, to, to simulate those who came before. And uh, in, in, in this reality, it's very difficult also to find a balance as in as much as um, wealth concentration, is wealth, wealth owning is, property owning is, is uh, concerned. Right, the, the the more powerful uh, is uh, the, the richer is tendentially going to absorb more, right? Why? Because the the, the status force is not that much. That's why before today we live in in in, in a world where states have the, the greatest power ever had in the history of mankind. Right? The state is something you know get crushed by. Uh, in those times, it wasn't at all like that, at all. Right, uh, it's not a big ecumenic empires like I don't know the the Persian, uh, the Alexandrine, the the Roman ones were capable of actually controlling the population. Why all these cooptation? Why were these also kind of open um, uh, cooptative um, uh, systems? Because there was no other way to, you know, to rule large amounts of of, of populations with those times coercion um, standards. But to to integrate these people in one another, of course, different empires did in different ways. Objectively, what Rome accomplished with its own citizenship it's something that no empire in the history of mankind has ever done, and the, part of the reason why it's you know deemed to be at least one of the single most uh, significant experience uh, in in the same history of mankind, and so much at the base of our concept of you know right individual rights and you know uh rewards for for a service for a duty to a public authority and so on but at the same time those pre-industrial old pre-industrial times were pretty harsh words were uh, there's you can't speak of, of a real justice you can't speak of a real stability you can't speak of a real wellness uh these were dark uh, abusive societies right most of our uh, you know human history has been exclusively about this but not because there was some wick uh, you know, some evil behind it more than in today's side, but because they didn't have any other mean to, to make things work with their level of, um, you know, of economical potential and, you know, technological development. And it, it took a, a very uh, long path before mm, settling certain certain resources and capacities and to start making things work in a, in a more sophisticated way, which actually passed mostly through through the history of ideas than through the history of of uh, of of matter, right? Um, the here we could make also big digressions about the value, as we were saying before, Roman Roman law of or Hellenic um, uh, logic and uh, Christian uh, freedom of conscience, and these are all things that 
up to a certain point in history didn't exist. So at a at a certain point they began, right? They began uh, out from scratch, right? There was surely something before it was already tried with, to develop that. But let's say that the world we know today is a sum of things that up to a certain point didn't exist. I mean, the fact I don't know that slaves were human beings. Well, it's something that before Christianity, objectively, people did not believe, but it was normal not to believe that. Yes, yeah, somebody, if you think about Seneca, said, "Well, okay, we have you know." Uh, slaves are, after all, human beings. We should tell, yeah, and, and still Seneca lived in it, you know, with his huge latifundi with all his slaves working like like animals. You know, the instrumenta se, um, vocalia, so the, they were called, you know, basically the vocal instruments, uh, the slaves at the time. The, the instrumenta semi vocalia were instead the animals. Uh, um, and just to, to give you a picture of that, this, this same goes for the tribal world. For the tribal world, the only ethics existing is the stronger has the right to rule and who was defeated you know nobody cares really um, and we'll partly see that because there is an ethics of work that also develops from certain works that naturally were more advanced they had maintained you know they, they had managed more resources they had necessarily developed more uh, simply intellective capacities to manage the whole thing but during the early medieval times, great part of that objectively goes lost, or at least, you know, there is the obvious realization that certain things simply didn't exist anymore for to, to, to be managed in that same way. But but things had changed. I mean, medieval people always remembered that there had been that past, and they knew what it was fundamentally about. It's not that they had a, a scientific understanding of history like t today, but they they surely knew that there had been an age in which certain things had been done and that were a, an important deal and, and surely this was still, as we were saying before, a different world, if anything, think about Christianization, but simply the fact that there had been, uh, even as we've seen, Roman law, think about the Germanic king, that they, they started legiferating in, in Latin on, on a base of, uh, you know, what had that thing had been in Roman and Germanic Europe, we, we call it for, for like this for, for a reason, right? Um, and um, for not talking about the sheer process of Romanization in the main uh, western provinces, Gaul, Italy, and the Iberian Peninsula, um, and, you know, the impact that the Roman legacy you know, it, it was mostly like a Roman, a, a romance reality at the end of the day than, than anything, even if it was, they were formally controlled by political, uh, by Germanic institutions and even laws, right, namely at least. Um, so you understand how the, 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 the breadth of topics that we could extend on discussing this stuff, but let's, let's talk specific of these collegia or collegia and and let's understand how the the thing came to contract towards the urban medieval times so first of all on the even of the imperial age uh, these organizations were bound by the state through a series of obligations that imposed on these collegia on these associations considered to be of public utility, a series of services for the community. Hmm? As in the case of, uh, I don't know, food professions, for example, or of the building arts, which were increasingly entrusted with the task of taking charge of the renovation and maintenance of city walls in other defensive, uh, defense works. This is very important because, you see, um, that's how the world emerges. It's not that, uh, you know, the world is born with states. The, the world is born with... Uh, microstates that are exactly these associations, right? When Augustus was, you know, troubled, it was half of the, of the empire controlled by, by Antony, and he had, you know, the, the you know, uh, the, the, all the troubles of the of the Central European frontier to maintain to keep the, the 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 Roman mob happy. You know, what he had to do was to control the city, and the city with the through the collegia went on on her own. Right, these were the people who, you know, brought the the food in the city, right? Or better, that that, you know, at least that that filtered it in a sense that lived on it. These were, like all pre-industrial societies, were dramatically corrupted. Really, this is the mob, right? Uh, it, it, when where there is not a state in the history of man, the, the only thing that rules, uh, 
from the tribal society to, to this more advanced, uh, you know, quasi-statal forms, it, it's the mob. It's private people that associate themselves autonomously and build eventually also what will become the state that comes remarkably in that sense also to deny this privatistic mindset that it's, it's objective uh, cancers for for an actual idea of of government, of justice, of legality, and so on. Um, so what the early emperors actually did was to co-opt these uh, this guilt, let's call it in this way, to actually make things work. Because you 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 wouldn't know how to rule these places, right? It's not that you could arrive, march on Rome with legions, and simply say, you know, now the city has to work. Well, you could wipe out a clan that. Uh, of, of Roman warlords, like during civil wars that, that held certain power outside, but you know, the concept is that the city was still something on its own, so what do you do? Do you exterminate all these people, all these collegia that, that give, literally, that, that, that feed great part of the population, that are actually the ones that rule the world? No, you have to come to terms with that, you have to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So, emperors, of course, in trust, um, very important branches of uh, also public administration to to these groups, or at least you know they they they, they basically function together, mm -hmm. and especially the the most important needs, right? Uh, food supplies for for these metropolises were huge, right? Uh, for Rome, it was traditionally. Uh, Sicily, Sardinia, uh, Africa. For Constantinople, it would be Egypt. Then later, the Ukraine, right? Because you need a freaking lot of food for feeding this mob. Also, this was a an empire still in expansion, so there was a lot of building, a lot of uh, infrastructural needs that also aimed, in fact, to to f keep fueling this system, so that actually all the workers that belong to the, this this craft and some were were necessary for for imperial policy as well. So the political and institutional difficulties, um, but not less those of an economic nature altogether, that which added to these and which interacted with them dating for the th from the third century with the crisis of the empire, contributed, however, in a decisive way to transform these forms of, uh, let's say, ministeriality. Um, the, the idea of minister, uh, etymologically speaking, is um, of an administrator, right? Is is to ad minus, right? So to ad ad minus to, to, to do those things that are of less importance. The administrator is not the, the guy truly in charge. It's just he who has to make the thing work underneath. And then there are the big guys at the top that have to instead command the whole stuff, right? This was a bit like in the army. The only the nobles actually commanded, but the NCOs naturally made everything work uh, from a practical point of view. That's also why we do not know much about certain details, because those guys didn't, weren't even expected to have a say in certain realities. So, uh, indeed, um, in these moments of crisis uh, uh, towards the, the end of the second and then eventually the third century, some emperors created some um, Collegia on their own, right? Uh, also, this happened also before. This was a, a way naturally to to tighten the grip also on on these. Um, they, they were at the end of the day clientels. were becoming kind of imperial clientels, but also um, were coerced to to function in a certain way. Imperial power is rising in monarchic terms now, so. The emperors really can't, the society is also beginning to suffer, so they're not so well off as before. So the, the state here begins to, you know, to, to increase its control on, on, these, uh, on these systems, even though they're not maybe as florid as before. But that's exactly the reason, because the state now needs something that simply could simply ask, right? It's like demographic resources. You lose three, three legions, a battle, the Theodore force, who cares? can raise how, mu how many you want. You, you lose 10,000 men in the 3rd century is a tragedy, right? Um, because there are not as many resources to replace. Um, so this, uh, um, let's say, mm, this collegia of imperial creation developed not on the basis of an emanation of the workers, but as bodies desired and controlled by the state. 
this is important because we objectively start to see these things would start again from the from the modern age, right? Where state begins to it's not I mean it's difficult to compare it to stuff, but let's say in the Middle Ages, guilds were powerful on their own, right? And the king had to negotiate with them in a sense. So it's very similar to the early imperial situation, even the late Republican one. Why? Because we were more thriving, they were more powerful. Medieval guilds were definitely way more developed uh, than than ancient ones. Think about banking, right? The, the I don't know, the Romans had something like the Argentari, there are beautiful, uh, but that's, you know, that that was um, not even properly a banking system, it had a much less com competitive and, uh, you know, economical potential together. Um, there was properly, we, this is what we have to, to understand, that properly the ancient world as a system didn't have the same resource, the, the same potential, um, uh, than the medieval one, right? And that, that there is no doubt in terms of mercantile capacities of exchanges and trade that the Middle Ages at some point boom in a way that, that the ancient world had never seen, right? We're simply a different type of society. Uh, many people say, oh, it's just because of the slaves. Well, yes, I mean, that was surely a factor, but it's not just that. It's, it's literally a, a more primitive world. It's something that has began to be built earlier. And it has less to work. And even slavery at that point was functional, actually. To you know, if this idea that, that there was no room for improvement for, for technology just because there were these great guys with the, the, the senatorial latifundi, but well, it doesn't quite render the idea of how much that that system was functional, even for the middle classes at the time. So surely, yes, if you know things had gone differently, it would have seen something different, but. Still, we're talking about the most advanced thing that existed at the time. That is Roman Empire. So, once again, yes, there's not a deterministic um, aspect for it. But you, you could have never had a, an industrial revolution, in spite of what lots of people delude themselves with in, in the ancient world. And not because slavery, right? But literally because if somebody had started building locomotives at the time, steam engines. First of all, first of all, it would have not happened because there were not the components of that. It's something you start having with enormous surplus from colonialism, 17th century, 18th century Europe. It's a completely different um, level of development. And, um, and, and secondly, had they even spent the actual amount of, of wealth to do that, they would have starved to death, right? Look at China's great leap forward, just just in case, you know, the, the, probably the greatest tragedy in the history of mankind. And th that's exactly the thing. If you force a society that doesn't have a spin of that doesn't have a, a, a background that can su support a certain technology, you, you, you cause a damage of incredible proportions. So never think that you're more intelligent or more capable than a person lived 2,000 years ago, because you are not, and especially you will never be. And that's the most important thing to bear in mind every time you wake up in the day. That you're no better by the slightest for people came from, than people that came before. Um, and that's where you have to get flexible. Not on the fact that, you know, the history has to be flexible for what you wish it to be. It doesn't work like that. Um, speaking of imperial colleges, so, some example, I don't know. Uh, there was a college of bakers established by Trajan. Bakers, right? So, of course... Bread loaves for keeping the mob uh, happy, um, established by Trajan. So we are uh, basically at the end of, of the of the first beginning of the second century AD. Um, those of shoemakers, winemakers, legume merchants, and many others still wanted by uh, Alexander Severus in the twenties and thirties, third century. The same for the boatmen who sailed the Tiber in in the Nile organized by Aurelian in the 70s of the 3rd century. So when the difficulties of the empire increased, the control of the state over the workers' associations increased proportionally, right? Faced with the escape uh, from the cities by artisans strangled by the increased and now oppressive tax burden, because the empire was basically about to come apart, the, the empire itself chose to pa uh, the path of making it possible for those who exercised it to abandon um, a, um, a profession um, and added the constraint to transmit uh, by of those who exercised it, right? Added the constraint of passing on the craft itself from father to son. 
to ensure the carrying out of the professions deemed the most necessary. Um, and in this sense, even forced enrollment was, was, was even made, uh, rounding up foreigners, prisoners, and illegal immigrants of every kind. Here they were running out of freaking demographic resources, so it's obvious why also uh, a, a guild would, uh, would change pretty much in its own nature. So Diocletian's reform uh, between the third and uh, the beginning, the end of the third, beginning of fourth century, in this sense, was perhaps the most significant act to block all mobility of workers. These had become a, pres a too precious asset for the empire not to try to ensure, in spite of all the economical, you know, mm, let's say uh, contraction that the same the same measure would have caused because you block the, the, the mobility in here, you, you cannot expect too much competition um, quality in the thing, but still there is also a lot of stuff that is now is properly developed by the state proper in terms, think about even in the military, right? Here we are actually witnessing a moment of technological improvement in late Roman times compared to pre previous ones. Um, but it's artificial because it's the state that begins by this work of centralization to invest for e in it, right? And it is worth adding for the sake of completeness of the picture that a similar measure was adopted also to bind the peasants to the land. Um, we're talking about free uh, f f freemen transformed into colonists that couldn't leave basically the, the land of, of their employers now de facto became their masters made a video speaking of the transition from the from the late Roman villa to the early medieval Curtis, right? It happened exactly like this, right? These people uh, didn't have any other option, right? It's not that they were just forced by the state, but they literally had no other place, no other to, to go, no other job. They, these were also many people were literally fleeing the cities. The, that mob were saying before, um, that uh, w was escaping the, 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 the airs of turmoil, of war, of, of plague, to, to find a, a, more, a greater stability in the countryside. At this point, it was coming back to be an important area of investment, like in, in moments of crisis. Uh, in a, still, of course, in a pre-industrial society where everything has ever been, always been based on the countryside, never think that since the Roman Empire was objectively an empire of cities, you know, the majority of the people ever lived <laughs> in two cities. This, this didn't happen to the last century, right? Um, it, 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 the majority of people lived in the countryside and in ways that were not even so different from, well, okay, well, they were different from, from before, where they, they were literally also properly warlike society. Because, I mean, in terms of actual farming, agricultural life, they were pretty much the same. At, at this point, even in fact, the, the most intensive exploitation of the workers has ceased because. One thing is to be uh, an early Roman imperial senator that has lots of lots of cheap slaves that the, the, the legions bring back like crazy from, from everywhere in the world and therefore can, you know, uh, exploit them, not even caring if they survive or not, right? Some, some think like concentration camps. Towards late Roman times, a slave is, is an important asset, right? Consider that the state, as we will see, also requires these people to participate to the army, uh, which means that they they are taken away from their masters. That, um, in this sense, tend to improve the quality over number, so that they ha they they actually have more. Uh, you know, a, 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 that you understand why a certain levels uh, technology even not sp maybe specifically in this, but you know. Um, there, there's a certain improvement, there is overall kind of the, the idea that y you're more pressed, right? So you have to find clever solutions, That that's how the point happens. So slaves were um, treated better and we're not even talking about properly, I mean the brutality involved, yes, it, it's it's not to, to diminish the concept of slavery, but I mean they're, they're turning to serfs more than slaves. Right, Christianity also helps for the aforementioned reasons because, in theory, everybody is equal at that point. There are these ideas are spreading, and the idea that a slave is not quite a slave in the sense we mean it, but actually more, a, and it's still a clientelly system, right? But 
uh, here the, the bonds are also society is um, de-stratified in a sense so that also the distance between the master and slave is decreasing at a level actually as far as the ant late antiquity continues this this model in spite of the contraction remains right as a you know the the one of the ancient latifundium etc but naturally in early medieval times things would, would dramatically change slaves are still there but um, they they have a um, proportionally a less, um, let's say, less importance, even just in terms of productivity, uh, productivity rates, than it had been before, right? And also, the condition of a freeman at that point is not different from the one of a slave. Actually, it's mostly the same thing uh, at the end of the day. Um, and even we, we've seen in the videos on the birth of the Vassalotic beneficiary system, it's actually sometimes, you know, being a, a slave or a serf that makes you of, of, of some some uh, powerful man that will make you more successful in your career than maybe an, a, a juridically free person that, however, lives in a place that is has no protection, has no um, uh, no guarantees of sort, and that if you look at mm, 300 years later, you find their descendants respectively being maybe a vice count and the other uh, literally a, a serf working for him, right? So that the roles had inverted. Sure is that, you know, living in those times wasn't uh, such a pleasant experience at all. However, the worsening of the irreversible imperial institutional crisis brought with it a further process of distortion of the trade associations with respect to the original purposes, right? The personal power assumed, especially in the Antonine Sever Severian age by senators, or municipal, m municipal magistrates had already made these characters equally patrons of this or that body of profession with, with, within uh, which each of them tried to create its own clientele to, to climb higher steps um, in, in power. Th this is important because it makes you realize that also the same Roman magistracies and eventually the, the system of government that would uh, emerge with this differentiation of you know degrees of power. You know, think about the viri lustres, this you know the, the, all the, these various steps in social ladder that um, were less standard than they actually sounded in practice, but ex exactly showed the need to to fix such divides that even if they were were being loosened, um, actually reflect a privatized society. Right, ancient cities, um, even in the most prosperous moments of the of the empire, were ruled by privates. Right, you would think they ruled the cities. Uh, like in early medieval times, it's bishops. Right, in in uh, in, in early imperial time, it's you know temples, these guilds, because they were all the same thing. Even religion was always there. There was not a moment in which there was a secular modern state with you know. Um, the lay idea that just never been like that. It was exclusively an, a, a religious military world, and there was no alternative to it in any kind. But the idea was that when you were a magistrate, you received basically the right to control a certain city, but you also had to provide to the empire something in return. So you had to transform this thing in a business. When the city naturally enters in crisis, because that that had been the center of government, right? Uh, lots of people begin to flee this. If you wonder how, also why, I don't know, aqueducts or, or roads decline, it's not just because of the traffic or because someone broke them down. It's because literally nobody had interest to make him running. What's the point of having an, an aqueduct working with all the enormous costs of maintenance and so on when you actually can't, the, the, the population has shrank in the city, can simply shift closer to the river and drink from there. Um, it, it literally happened like that. And most people would simply go, leave in the countryside. And these imperial measures were kind of in vain eventually, right? The state of obviously had this need of maintaining a public authority of centralizing, but um, it had also increased the advantages of, of, of the collegia themselves to make them immune, for example, from, a, from patronage that was so pernicious for the public value of trade as associations. The uh, the personal power of the patterns had not therefore relaxed uh, in, in, in this. But the constraint that by now tightened the late Roman colleges had 
completely negative effects, right? In fact, it discouraged the process of escape from the masters, but it did not stop it. And in return, charged the, the very high costs of removing any elasticity and any dynamism. When we think of the so-called Byzantine period, sometimes we think, ah, this thing was always great, you know, it's all a farce, a myth that, you know, uh, there was a, a, a great uh, moment before and after these were just decadent society. Of course, that's a myth. But the question, we, we have to realize, the, 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 for example, the loss in dynamism of economical activities that, surprise, surprise, by the 12th century in the West, surprise, uh, excuse me, surpass and surprise too. I would say that the same Roman Empire in Constantinople, well, that's something you cannot but take into account. Those were more static, more um, crystallized societies. Look at how wealth worked in Constantinople, how basically the empire in the long run by Comnenian times had become just a private possession of just the, the, the oligarchs who lived in Constantinople. Right? And and, and there was basically no other city but Thessalonica out there, because all the others in these dramatically um, urbanized areas that had been such in Roman times, such as Asia Minor or even Greece, uh, now have a aspectic uh, economical potential. It's because this system had sucked everything in. In a way, it's... Uh, it, it was it was functional, right? It was for um, for certain standards necessary to do. Actually, it was clever. Even uh, if you look at Constantinian reforms, um, there was a sense in them, because it was mostly the adaptation to real, a reality that had already taken place. But at the same time, it was a system that kept insisting on the long run on on these same mm, on this same formula, we could say, the same fundamentals that at a certain point became uh, not competitive with what was happening in the outer side. Now, this is also a very big topic that here is a bit simplistically addressed by me because I uh, I should make a video at some point to, 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 to explain specifically why I, I end up in saying this stuff. Of course, now we're talking about post Constantinian times in a while, so you understand that it's actually it actually fits. But we have to to make an effort sometimes to to go to look beyond what we are normally literally told to think. Right? We cannot pat on each other's shoulders just because we share like something we have listened and but from, from somewhere and, and just because we have had this common experience we have simply to stick to it because it makes us think you know that's our identity we are like that you know we have to properly realize that every system must be analyzed and that will teach you to compare them it will show you that certain realities you you can't really just starting from from the the assumption that they they were let's say good or bad just because I don't know they were glorious more or less etc these were first of all very homogeneous worlds but at the same time it's 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 easier exactly for this reason to under, to to compare them and to see that if some went forward like eventually a Roman of Germanic Europe would go at some point also encompassing broader areas in the end. Um, this system, it's because there was a specific reason, right? It's not just random. It's structured. It has to do with with some big devil, right? Well, late Roman times here are crucial to understand even how certain areas dealt differently from others. So, in, in the post-Constantinian age, in order to put a, a late remedy to state affairs, which is now irreversible, um, also, the empire set up a, a, mm, a, pug, uh, a program of public aid, let's say, for the artisans. But once again, all this did not prevent many urban ar artisans to, from escaping the surveillance of institutions, abandoning the city and taking refuge, reconverted into peasants. They were doing it themselves. Nobody was obliging them, right? Or at least the conditions, of course, were not good. It's not that they could start their own business and become, you know powerful out there, uh, but it was just, you know, better than being uh, forced to be an artisan in the city, right? They preferred joined large estates, so the larger rural owners 
um, they, of whom they therefore went to swell the personal clientele in exchange for protection and above all for all the tax claims. This is a dynamic that will remain when you look at, for example, we'll see it in a while, countries where there was an evident, like from one side were the Romans, from another side were the Germans. Uh, think about Byzantine Longobard Italy. It's plenty of, 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 of evidence that, of explicit, uh, actually complaints of from the, the side of, from, from Roman held territories of, of peasants fleeing their territory to go even to the Longbart lands. Right? There is all the, the Ostrogothic mm, promise also the time of the, of the Gothic war uh, to, of freeing all the colonists for fighting against the Byzantines in Italy because that system w had become somewhat uh, you know they didn't want to leave like that anymore nor c as colonists but especially not under the heavy tax system of the empire and th that that's quite important because it's not necessarily a positive or negative thing but it, it's a divide that uh, that a certain point will see um from from the uh, r uh germanic side rising something else right still on, on the roman basis but still with a completely different uh, balance of that power right Th this is also a moment of contraction so you can't see the immediate uh, the thing immediately but it's exactly from those centers that during the 8th the 9th we we know the vassalitic beneficiary system that is the same one from which eventually urbanism and and uh, and um, I don't know feudal Europe I mean, as a civilization. I mean, will emerge. We know it's it, it's diversity, it's complexity, it's dynamism. It's something that we made a video about this. The Byzantine Empire, the Islamic world, did not have right. Also, many other areas of Europe, like in the East, especially, uh, but that still managed. You know, the, the the West managed to 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 make grow even just by osmosis of the system. Right and and in in the long picture here, here it's really important uh, a consequence um, with uh, that you know pregnant with no small consequences for subsequent history was that of making the relationship between the Italian industry and that of other parts of the empire increasingly unbalanced. This was another fascinating thing, uh, of which especially other regions, mainly in Germanic territory, went to benefit. Right, uh, we're talking about the transfer of skills and technologies um, that, up to this point, had been uh, prerogative of the Italian territory. So you have this major crisis where uh, you have squeezed too much, also the middle classes that flee in other lands, right, and uh, leave the latifundium in these other areas. So there is a lot of know-how, uh, capacity, literally the same people physically speaking, to go leaving those countries that start having also a, kind of a dynamism on their own. Surely do not top uh, southern Europe, but begin to, to grow at, at a consistent rate in a structural way that objectively had uh, not had never existed in those regions before. If not, uh, you know, in relative terms, but in completely different contexts, right, I don't know, yeah, during the Bronze Age, you can talk about a great deal of technology going on in Central Europe, but still, you know, we're talking I mean, uh, a tip of the iceberg in terms of the, how the world politics and society function, and is, you know, the technological potential, of course, in those times was was uh, even more ridiculous than later ones. But uh, the the question here is is um, is also realizing that the the West is beginning to set itself in motion on other patterns, on other bases. Uh, the last period of the empire experienced uh, a late and therefore also useless turnaround in the relationship between the college and the institutions because there is a collapse literally um, this system has uh, tried to tighten the grip too much so much that it broke uh, the same system during the 5th century the liberalization of professions returned Yes, because there was no way to control them anymore. Everything had gone so private that privatized that there was no uh, 
a proper um, uh, way to, to handle things. They figured even about, I don't know, the bishops to take over the cities. Why? Well, of course, they had received uh, uh, an imperial delegation. But this happened in areas where the state had evaporated, right? So it's not that it was like that in Constantinople, right? But bishops start to do, start to make civilization, start to care about the, the, the administration of the city as, as a thing on its own. It's they, they start caring at certain points, especially during the sixth, about the countryside. Start do something that the that really begins like kind of the medieval view, right? We made a a, uh, a bit about Gregory. Um, Gregory the Great and uh, Santa Quitius about in, in 6th century Italy that, that's actually a remarkable example of how these local bases began literally to make civilization and to also uh, create a, a broader connection between Western European lands right? And the church was fundamental in that um, uh, indeed, many ties uh, which bound certain cities, um, 5th century, to the state, were loosened or completely dissolved. Um, and in those cases in which these constraints, due to the specific nature of some professions, could not completely dissolve, nevertheless the obligatory services were compensated with the granting of privileges and immunities. A new stiffening on the part of power, by like no one would no longer have the courage to, to say of the, the, the state, occurred um, in um, in the period of Ostrogothic domination in Italy between the end of the 5th and the first half of the 6th century, right? Not that things were so bad as we were saying, actually we talk often about Ostrogothic Italy, but surely, you know, the system had changed dramatically. It had become, uh, yes, we often said how the Roman administration survived, right? The Germans were interested uh, with, the, uh, with the army. Um, and so on, but it, it's obvious that uh, in terms of public authority, like the, the system was very, very different from the one of the previous centuries. There had, uh, especially uh, before the, the fifth, where central power had in, you know the, uh, been eroded, um, the Ostrogoths actually gave some some backbone to it uh, again. But generally speaking, this tension between the, the Roman the great blown Roman landowners, we had this huge amount of land, right, and, and it conflicted with the interests of, you know, of, uh, of an integration. And that's also what the Gothic War emerged, right? So in this period, uh, th there is actually a, a general decay of artisan production, right? It led to a new market control over professional associations in respect of which the new rulers, however, showed no other interest beyond that uh, proportion to the public uh, utility they carried out. You know, some activities even were managed directly by state property. And that's where probably state property had become sort of uh, private property on, it, on its own regard. But it, the picture here is complex. Um, and if in this region, however, a semblance of organization of trades was maintained, elsewhere all forms of association of workers were lost. This is not surprising, because the concept of work among the barbarians was invariably, as uh, Le Goff highlighted, placed at the lowest levels of mental representations. Pick the customs of the Burgundians at the end of the 6th, beginning of 7th century, for example, um, you know, in, in establishing the, the rates of compensation for people in the event of their killing, or the very killed. Mm -hmm. Predictably, this law placed goldsmiths and silversmiths at the highest levels, but established incomparably lower figures for blacksmiths and carpenters, not to mention those that ultimately concerned land workers, right? But even in Italy, things did not go any better than what happened in, in the Gothic Age when, it, with 553, the armies of Narses brought finally the peninsula, albeit precariously as regards about half of it under the Byzantine imperial control, right? In here we're talking literally of a land that is exploited like a foreign one, right? It's not that the Romans have much more to do with now what Italy has become. And in fact, um, the restructuring of the administration wanted by Justinian led to, a, to an attempt of strong centralization of all state functions on the court of Constantinople, in many cases on the figure of the emperor himself, and in this climate, therefore, no other fate was reserved for professional association 
then uh, associations to that of the total subordination of the state trans thus transformed into bureaucratic articulations of central power totally emptied of autonomy, dynamism. And they remain in this state even in the centuries following the reconquest, at least until the 10th century, but if this was the situation in Byzantine Italy, little different happened uh, in Longbird one, where all traces of artisan associations disappeared, except for a few cases, telling a truth that would become, in fact, be at the base, think about the Comacini masters. Uh, in uh, the alpine foothills of Lombardy, that those were important uh, builders, um, you know, architects, artisans that maintained some. And, and the city there was connected with some. Yeah, these were some of the few areas in the west where you can see that specific dynamism remaining a bit in early, in early uh, medieval times. Right, but altogether, the political and social situation, the demographic and economical contraction, uh, just seeing pandemics had left, you know, a completely changed society with a very few uh, economic potential. Uh, the caters of society uh, that were mainly warrior on the one hand or rural on the other, in fact, did not leave room for organized forms of trade which no trace is actually found in the Longobard legislation, not even when Lutprand, at the beginning of the 8th century, uh, high still towards the, the mid 8th, um, were opening right to an economy that at least was not exclusively agricultural, was, you know, a bit of more recirculation, restarting it uh, importantly, especially from the Po Valley. And the traces of, dra of, of trade organizations in the Longobard and sunk subsequently Longobard Carolingian cities of Italy, for example in Pavia, it was the capital of the kingdom, do not seem to refer, in fact, to any function other than that of supplying goods and services to the court present in that city. This is important especially as far as the Carolingian phase is concerned because naturally um, we know that um, also the in that case we're sp speaking of Italy, like, you know, um, the Carolingians kind of stratified society more, so it's obviously that it's obvious that uh, we we see even from from trade that the, the, this stuff was revived um, mostly from gravitating around elites and the, the elites that were becoming ever more elites in uh, in Carolingian and post Carolingian Europe, right? So uh, that's a bit uh, not the whole picture because still in these areas um, south of the Alps was more more dynamism still, right? The, 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 these had remained constantly since the Roman Empire, the, the regions with the higher mm, per capita wealth in the world, um, in spite of all the crises and everything. So it's obvious that that's where, you know, transactions, uh, document, written documents too. These were highly literate people for, for early mm, you know, regions, for, uh, for early medieval standards. Um, show a dynamism, but still it's substantially the vassalitic elite that is truly controlling the thing and actually improves the same, however, local conditions over time because it helps to channel, to rationalize, to reunify under a less dispersed um, activity. Mm -hmm. So, well, we have talked about this with, uh, about also many, you know, many other videos, but I hope that this video points out the uh, the problems regarding to what we see as a as a continuity between Roman and medieval times, because you realize here it's a naturally here it goes down to the bottom end, right, or to the uh, that was ever reached in this process of of um, trade organization, because if we were to speak now from the 8th century, 9th century onwards, we'll see actually a rise again. But surely what, the, you know, the big college we see in the Roman Empire had vanished in that sense. So it's, it's something else that happens in their turn, but with, with um, political and social transformations that actually have a few to do with previous cutters. So yes, th there is a break, there is a chisura, there is a moment of um, you know, of, of deep 
change that that is such especially when it, it happens just within a society that is simpler that therefore can be more easily changed and we're talking about the early medieval one right uh, at so many levels so the cultural demographic one i mean the changes that occur in early medieval europe are the most impacting in terms of uh, what you know uh, on the basis of which will uh, later europe would fundamentally emerge so that's actually the the, the, the deal mm -hmm. um so i feel as if i stopped in in uh in the middle of um of, of lots of stuff we could profitably uh, expand but let's say let's take step by step and let's reconnect to this on another occasion because there are at least other i don't know other 10 videos we could make on on on, uh, on topics that are related to this connected to this not just from a the perspective of a chronological continuation however for now we stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye